Good evening, everyone. I would like to call to order the governing board meeting of April 24, 2012. Everyone is welcome this evening. I understand this is going to be a very long meeting, so at midnight we'll take a five-minute break. <laughs> Otherwise, full bore ahead. Uh, <clears throat> the board offers opportunity for members of the public to address the governing board, and in compliance with open meeting lo the law, the governing, excuse me, uh, I, I missed a, a section. We, we have some uh, substitutes tonight that I want to recognize before we uh, do the citizens' interim. Uh, Oh, that's right. We have two. <laughs> Let's start all over. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Let's do a Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, We have two substitutes tonight. Andrea Berman is sitting in for Dr. Maria Harper Marinick, and Janet Ortega is uh, sitting in for Dr. Sherry Olson of South Mountain Community College. Welcome to all of you. Um, now, I believe we are at the citizens' interim. The board offers opportunity for members of the public to address the governing board in compliance with open meeting law. The Governing Board will neither discuss nor take action on issues raised during the portion of the agenda. When necessary, issues will be taken under advisement and placed on a subsequent agenda. I have one name for citizens' interim, uh, Ms. Lori Sullivan. Ms. Sullivan? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Maricopa Community College Governing Board. My name is Lori Sullivan. I am the machine shorthand court reporting lab technician at Gateway Community College. For uh, 22 years ago, I began my career with Maricopa. I have been a board approved employee for 19 years. On November 9, 2011, I was notified that my position will be eliminated due to budget cuts effective June 30th, 2012. The division chair, and the director of the program had no prior knowledge of the impending layoff. In an advisory committee meeting for the court reporting department earlier this month, the faculty questioned Dean Stommer about the loss of the position. She stated that a committee was formed to decide on the budget cuts. I would like to see the notes and the minutes from this committee's meeting to see how they determined my position was no longer important because this position has been in existence for 37 years. Enrollment is up. Additional classes and certificates have been added. <clears throat> My duties have not diminished. They have increased exponentially over the years. I am the only staff member in a department of eight faculty and nearly 100 students. I do everything from registration to ordering supplies <clears throat> to assisting with the software. There is one faculty member who knows more about the software my students use than I do, and she's leaving. About a year ago, I was told to assume <clears throat> excuse me, additional duties on top of my, the ones I'm already responsible for. The Learning Center required extra help. Instead of hiring new people, they gave me the jobs. In a meeting with PSA, the Chancellor stated, we will work with employees to find them another position within the district before letting them go. I have been unsuccessful in finding this assistance through no fault of my own, because I have asked repeatedly. There are many different interpretations on this policy point. 
This is why I'm speaking to you today. I would request assistance in finding a position in the district based on PSA policy in the in a few years past when Gateway Campus laid off several employees they were found positions on other campuses I only ask I receive the same opportunity the same opportunities that have been previously offered to other employees in light of my dedication and loyalty to Maricopa Com Community College system upon receiving notice I began searching uh, jobs in the district. Since that time, I have applied for 24 positions, all of which I met or exceeded the minimum requirements. I've interviewed for 11, and I've been denied each one. I understand reorganization, but as short-staffed as some of the campuses and the individual offices are obvious by the number of job openings listed through the district since November. Why am I not finding employment? Based upon the PSA manual under the section entitled Professional Staff Personnel Rights, page 19, layoff for lack of work or funding, it states, Should there be need for additional training, a written agreement to the employee and the appropriate unit supervisor, a written plan will be agreed upon. Number two, for the purpose of layoff, a professional staff employee will be transferred on the basis of seniority defined in the order, paid time in service with the district, paid time in, in within classification. With regard to the policy stated above, I have not received offer for additional training, nor have I been assisted in making a lateral transfer. Because I hold a unique position in the district, I understand there would not be an exact transfer available because of the classification of my job. However, I have met and exceeded the minimum qualifications for numerous positions that have become available since I was given notice of termination. I have been offered, I have not been offered assistance to transfer as indicated on the policy. Because of my unique position and because of the lack of assistance from the HR staff, I request that my name be removed from the separation list that will be voted on during this meeting. After removal of my name from the list, I am also requesting that HR staff be directed to assist me in transforming, I'm sorry, in transferring me to a position that will be suitable based on my qualifications and allow me to continue to service that serve the district as I have done for more than 19 years. The core reporting program is going to continue whether I'm there or not. The work is going to continue, the faculty will continue teaching, students will continue taking classes. Would it be possible for someone to explain to me why my position is being eliminated? Aren't we here to serve the students? There is no other school in the entire state of Arizona or Nevada that teaches court reporting. So as strong as our program is, why is all of the support staff, me, being eliminated? And why have I been left out of the process of getting assistance to find another job within the district? Thank you for your consideration and your time. Thank you. Um, this is a bit awkward because uh, we can't act on uh, the request during a uh, citizen's interim. Uh, Ms. Jackson, would you care to comment on this? No, you can't. 
not on the agenda. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you for your comments. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. All right. Are there governing board uh, reports, Dr. Campbell? No report, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Lam? Yeah. Um, I'd like to report that um, there's um, okay, four board members at the Heroes of Education. There's an outstanding uh, a fundraiser and dinner. Uh, thank you for, for inviting us, and uh, congratulations on uh, student success, the fundraising, the, the money you raised, and the outstanding job your staff has, has done. Um, also, uh, all the board members attended a luncheon for the accreditation of Glendale Community College. We're really proud of the work uh, Glendale's done and Dr. Kovala has done in her eight months here. Uh, the uh, Higher Learning Commission is very uh, pleased with the work Glendale has done, and it was a, it was a proud moment. And I know um, you come here eight months, and then all of a sudden <laughs> you're being accredited. And uh, it was a long process, so congratulations to the staff at Glendale. We haven't heard the final results, but they, they kind of change how they do results. They don't announce them at the time like they did at a, the two prior uh, accreditations. Um, but my congratulations to the staff at Glendale for all the hard work they did to uh, get accredited, and I'm sure there's not going to be any findings uh, with Glendale. Um, uh, today I had the chance to go to um, Voice. Voice is Voice of Maricopa is the um, the um, voice of conclusion for the uh, handicap group of uh, Maricopa. Of Maricopa. And it was really exciting to be there and see how they advocate for the handicap. Their goal is to recruit, hire, retain, and advance high-quality employees uh, with disabilities. And um, so I encourage everybody, if you're doing um, program planning, facility planning, to be sure to include someone from VOICE, uh, and they can help you with what the disability needs. Um, that's my report. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stark? None. Ms. Pearson? I think M Mr. Long covered it all pretty well. Okay. Ditto. Uh, I would like to add to that, uh, a, uh, uh, several of us went to Scottsdale Community College uh, last week and uh, looked at some developmental programs that they were doing. We were able to meet with some students and with some tutors uh, in the developmental program as well as some faculty members. Um, and uh, it was uh, very enjoyable to you hear that report? I had one thing. Um, no. We went to the grand opening of several board members. It's the grand opening of Rio Suato's new building at 619 North 7th Avenue, and really proud of the facilities. It was a, a green building. Um, the staff, the, I mean, the classes are already going on. It was fun to meet the students and, and see them, and it was a great a grand opening. And uh, Archbishop Monte, congratulations on, on changing downtown Phoenix and investing in, in that area. And, uh, and it's good to see, and it's, and it's good um, you. for um, um, GED programs and um, and adult ed. Uh, Dr. Glasper, Chancellor's report. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I have two items that I would like to report on this evening. The the presidents who have uh, campuses within the city of Phoenix. Uh, and I and Dr. Maria Harper Marinick had an opportunity to speak to our the new mayor of Phoenix, uh, um, Mayor uh, <laughs> Mayor Greg Stanton. <laughs> and and during the the meeting, we had an opportunity to share with them some of the projects that each of the individual colleges are working on, and to ask uh, for his consideration for us to began to look at some programmatic activities within the downtown area that might facilitate partnerships that may include uh, the increasing opportunities with the Phoenix Union and the community colleges and the universities that are in the downtown area, but also to expand in the areas of workforce, especially around uh, the, the incubation center uh, that's, that's down on the Gateway Campus. And we also talked about uh, the, the individual projects that are going on with the expansion of, of Phoenix College moving to its new facilities and others, and then uh, with uh, Dr. Bustamante as well. 
we were able to, uh, to talk about the new site uh, on 7th Avenue. We are also are, are, are focusing on the, the joint library. We think that that's a good project in terms of South Mountain. So there are a number of synergies that are going on, and we expect to have some continued conversations with, with the new mayor as we move forward. I had an opportunity last week to go to uh, my, my fourth meeting of the Attainment Commission. This is a commission that was pulled together last uh, year in order to look at the President's goal of increasing the number of certificates and degrees by the year 2020, consistent with the Board's completion goal. We are almost completed uh, with our uh, study in terms of answering uh, questions as to whether or not the, the goal is achievable, and if so, over what period of time, and with what resources, and uh, what will actually uh, need to be the engagement at each of the, the functional levels, but, but primarily faculty. So I would expect to come back to the board sometime in, in early fall with the final report to share with them so that we can get an idea of what's going on nationwide in regard to the attainment and completion agenda. That's all I have tonight. Thank you. Uh, Secretary's report, Mr. Sark. None. Thank you. Uh, student life reports. Uh, we have two. The first is the SMC Student Leadership Group. Good evening, President Burke, members of the board, Chancellor Glassford, members of the Chancellor Executive Committee, and distinguished guests. My name is Flora Chavez, Chair of the South Mountain Community College Student Governance Board. These following students are also members of the Governance Board. Hello, my name is Ever Hernandez. I am Treasurer of the Governance Board. Hello, I am Mick Malone. I am Co PR Officer. Okay. Thank you. Uh, to start off, we would like to share our mission with you guys. The Student Governance Board strives to promote and provide program services and events for the students and staff at our community college. Some of our goals include informing students of our Student Governance Board as well as our mission involve students in the overall planning of student life and leadership programs, provide educational program opportunities throughout the school year, maintain records of board meetings, and maintaining a budget. Some of the summer leadership training that we have for our students are parliamentary procedures training, leadership assessments, event planning, cash handling, as well as the leadership um, district retreat. We oversee over um, 18 student clubs ranging from nursing clubs, Black Student Union, the MECHA, the um, Club Teach, Engineering Club, Veterans Club, uh, Minority Males, Medical, and Phi Theta Kappa. Some civic participation events that we've had throughout the year include Constitution Day, Voter Registration, Connecting the Dots, which was a uh, career day. We worked alongside other um, departments from our campus, and two weeks ago we finished off our Relay for Life where we raised about $1,400. Um, um, some of our community service events include um, going to the Andre House monthly, uh, our, tow, our tour drive during the winter season, and um, MLK in January, as well as Make a Difference Day. Other campus events that we have are the women's luncheon and the men's luncheon each semester. we provide a educational, both inspirational and educational speaker for our students. Um, flipping for finals, where we provide students with a free breakfast or meal the week before finals. Um, our spring fling and our burgers and basketball, which is like the first game of the season. Uh, we have a Twitter account, Facebook account, and Foursquare U uh, YouTube channel. So if you guys just want to look for us, mm -hmm. Google us and we're, we're there. Thank you. Right. We appreciate those service projects especially. I'm wondering, how many hours a week do you put in on student government? 
a lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, um, we're actually planning to um, flip in for finals. We're actually having one on Friday for the evening students, uh -huh. and then one next Thursday for the students at our Guadalupe Center, uh -huh. or Guadalupe campus, so, so yeah. We appreciate your hard work. Thank you, uh -huh. thank you. The second group is the Student Public Policy Forum. Hi, my name is Bridget O'Brien. I'm a secondary education major at Paradise Valley Community College. Hi, my name is Eden Jarman, and I'm from South Mountain Community College. My major is in Global Health. Hi, my name is Manuela Mikesell. I come from Scottsdale Community College, and my uh, major is nursing. Um, we're here to speak on behalf of the 2011-2012 Student Public Policy Forum, or SPIF, as we like to call it. Uh, SPIF is a year-long program starting in <coughs> September, and it runs till April. We meet every other Friday. Uh, each session is, has a clear learning objective with homework that supports all of our learning objectives with key concepts. Each session is highly interactive and features subject matter experts that come in and speak with us. Um, we have many programs and goals that benefit the students in SPIF. Uh, the program provides opportunities to practice and further develop listening and leadership skills and civic discourse. Also, we learn to respect others' opinions while we still effectively advocate our own. The participants are a diverse group with respect to age, background, experiences, thoughts, and majors. The common bond is a desire to deepen our understanding of our political system and to become more effective participants in the, pol the policy making process. Throughout SPIF, we had the opportunity to meet with and network with different officials from throughout our state. We had the opportunity to practice public speaking as well on a higher level by uh, taping our speeches and getting to watch them back and critique at the Pu Mesa Public School Educational Television Facility. As well, as you can see in the picture, we got to go to the state capitol, we got to sit in the speaker's chair, we all took turns, and then we got to visit with all of our with different state officials and talk to them about each of our different campuses. Spiff on the road. Um, this picture is when we visit in D.C. This was one of our groups um, who got to meet with Quail, right? Quail. So, uh, <laughs> the SPIF program has offered us many opportunities to travel and participate in conferences, discussions, and town halls throughout the year. In fact, we are missing a lot of students today because they are participating in the 100th town hall in Tucson, so they cannot be with us. Uh, we went to the Capitol in December and we got to meet with our representatives and district sen and our senators. Uh, we've done the 99th Town Hall, and like I mentioned, we also are doing the 100th Town Hall today. Um, in D.C., we got to advocate for our campuses, our dis um, for our campuses on district international level policies, as in Pell Grants and student loans. Um, many students are passionate about issues but don't have the underlying skills to be effective. This program provides a solid foundation in the policymaking process and helps us develop into active, engaging, and informed citizens. We've had the opportunity to work on public speaking skills, media relations, and effective advocacy, and these are lifelong skills. There, there is a great power behind the individual and collective action. These are just a few examples of how we are already putting into practice what we've learned. Over 500 students and community members have been touched by all of these experiences. We all hope to continue to give back and add to the SPIF success stories. Right now, SPIF alumni are serving on public school governing boards, working in Washington, D.C., and pursuing different careers in the government. <laughs> Student Public Policy Forum has given me the opportunity to grow in my understanding of our local and our national government. We've all been given amazing opportunities to meet with our officials and have learned to have an effective voice in the public policy process. Uh, this program has affected me in a great way. SPIF has taught me to be confident and strong in my advocacy plan. Also, I now understand more clearly what civic engagement means and how you can change the future. <laughs> <laughs> 
this program has done for me is it helped me gain confidence in my abilities as an advocate, but not only for my school, but as a representative of the Hill River Indian community. It has also given me a greater understanding of the public policy and amazing networking skills. And I feel blessed to have had this opportunity not only to learn, but I feel honored to be taught by great instructors and the other students from the different community colleges. Thank you to Dr. Glasper, Dr. Harper Marinick, Dr. Ronin, Ronin, and all the governing board members for supporting SPIF and its students. <clears throat> This is another example. Um, I, tomorrow morning, actually, 9 o'clock, one of your former members from just a couple of years ago is announcing his candidacy for Congress in Southeast wow. Valley, uh, Spencer Morgan. Um, oh, wow. So, uh, we didn't know that. <laughs> well, thank you very You're much. You're next. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We are. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. You have addressed one of the four outcomes that the governing board has set. This is a wonderful program. Uh, and for the audience, this Friday at 1 p.m., there will be a display in this room, and the members of SPIF will, will show what projects they've done this year. Uh, and if you come, you might be asked to help uh, evaluate those projects. <laughs> but I encourage everyone to be here at 1 o'clock on Friday to see those projects. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Faculty Executive Council Report. Eddie Jenna. President Burke. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, members of CEC, Chancellor Glasper, uh, members of the Governing Board, that's the right order. You and I have the same thing going on tonight. Uh, distinguished guests, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm happy to report that the Faculty Executive Council has just held its elections uh, for next year, and the uh, President-elect, who will begin serving in May, is Kath Dr. Kathleen Ayuticello of Australia Mountain Community College. Uh, I'm extremely excited about Kathleen as a uh, successor to our group. Uh, she's dedicated, she's smart, she's been with the faculty a long time, and she understands uh, both faculty values and partnership, so we're delighted with that result. Uh, Harold Cranswick, who you know, uh, was already elected as president-elect, and starting in May, he will secede to the office of president. That concludes my report, oh, except to say, I have a former student at Phoenix College who just announced his candidacy for the state legislature, who was also in SPIF, so we're on a roll here. Uh, Johnny Mendez? Yeah, so. There's a difference between state legislature and Congress. Yeah, state legislature. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you very much. Thank you. Half a million dollars. Half a million. Uh, employee group reports, uh, Phil Jalloway, uh, adjunct faculty. You mean I'm not going to have uh, Eddie to follow all the, yeah, every, every month? Very good. No. <laughs> anyway, I think uh, a round of applause for Eddie's service uh, yes. should be uh, given. Yeah. I'm sure he will find ways to uh, be uh, exciting uh, for us. Be heard. And be heard? Yeah, we can hear him all the way across the district. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, good evening, everyone. President Burke, uh, members of the Governing Board, Chancellor Glasper, uh, members of CEC, and our many guests. Uh, the Spring Adjunct Faculty uh, Learning Conference was held at Scottsdale College on April 14th. We want to thank the uh, Maricopa Center for Learning and Instruction, uh, always known by MCLI. Uh, for sponsoring and facilitating the conference, as well as President Geller and the staff at Scottsdale College uh, for their uh, great support. It was, a, it was a spectacular event, and uh, I wanted to just share that this evening. Uh, we thank uh, uh, Chancellor Glasper for his uh, keynote uh, presentation on disruptive innovation and student success. He invigorated all the adjunct faculty uh, by sharing the broad picture of the challenges of our enterprise and, uh, and uh, talking to uh, areas that we uh, as adjunct faculty might participate. 26 uh, adjunct faculty were recognized for their outstanding service. 
uh, to the students of the Maricopa Colleges as the culmination of this new multi-phase recognition process that we've uh, uh, fortified this year. Uh, we thank uh, the Executive Vice Chancellor uh, Maria Harper Marinick for her kind remarks and welcoming participation in this recognition program. Uh, I know every one of the honorees was uh, very appreciative. Uh, we also recognized 46 adjunct faculty who achieved the milestone of 15 years of service to the district, as well as 10 and 5 year adjunct faculty in attendance. Uh, this is part of an expanded recognition uh, initiative. Uh, some of the statistics are shown on this slide. Uh, amongst our 6,153 adjunct faculty who have achieved the 15, 10, and 5 year milestones. Uh, this uh, undertaking of uh, recognition involves 679 adjunct faculty who achieved these milestones this year, as well as a retroactive recognition for 1,952 adjunct faculty who achieved these milestones in previous years. All of the honorees have been identified in the adjunct faculty recognition spring 2012 publications that came with your materials. Uh, these publications, uh, as well as a sample letter uh, that has, go has gone out to each of the uh, 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 adjunct faculty we've been recognizing, uh, we're in the process, it's not a small undertaking, uh, uh, is going on in the next couple of uh, weeks. Again, thank you for all of the uh, college presidents and uh, to, for supporting this event, for attending the conference, and thank you again, it's Governing Board, for uh, your continued support. Thank you. Uh, Ted Jorgis, uh, M&O. <laughs> President Burke, Governing Board, Mr. Chancellor, members of your CEC, and all you good folks have come here this evening to help us conduct the business that pertains to Maricopa. Most of you know, but my name is Ted Georges, and I am uh, honored to be the president of the Unified Crafts Association. That's all your plumbers and electricians and HVAC guys and, you know, uh, painters and mechanics. Uh, we come here tonight to honor three people. Uh, the way Crafts does it, in case you don't know, we do it with uh, donations to student scholarships. But first, I'd like to say a, a couple words about safety. Now, I've just finished my 40th year in the electrical business. And coincidentally enough, 40 years ago, the President of the United States signed a law that put in effect the Occupational and Safety and Health Administration, that's OSHA. And it's so important. At first they did it because they wanted people to know that they have a right to come home with all the same fingers and toes they went to work with. But over the years, it's not only been for construction workers, it also now applies to people in many occupations. People who sit behind desks and work all day, uh, that go home with back aches or uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. So I want to recognize the district in their brilliance to bring aboard a man who some don't quite understand what he does yet, but Mr. Victor Anderson, he is now the OSHA compliance manager for Maricopa. And the thing about OSHA is, it seems like it's, you know, a lot of trouble or something to begin with. But healthier employees are better employees. They have better morale, they're more productive, and you might even save some money on some workman comp insurance. So it's very important that people embrace this OSHA program. The district's gone to a lot of trouble to bring this forth, and I want people to give the administration of this district a hand for doing that. Safety is everybody's business and we do have a right to go home with all our fingers and toes and body parts. Please. Thank you, Chancellor Gatt, for leading the way. Now, I'm here first to honor a college who I worked for 13 years ago. And they always, always were heavy on training. And they brought in OSHA programs to let people know about hazarded materials, bloodborne pathogens, proper ways to lift, proper ways to, uh, to conduct your business, and proper ways to avoid hazards at the workplace. Now this has always improved morale, and it's always made people feel that they're cared for. 
And it's not just a nice thing to do, it's good business. The second thing I would like to do is to recognize the same college for their participation in the apprenticeship program. Now, I worked with an employee many years ago who worked at this college, and through the years, he did a fine job and everybody learned to respect him, and he became a candidate for the apprenticeship. And this year, beginning in July, he will go forth to this college, spend his last year of apprenticeship through the auspices of our Vice Chancellor of HR, who sponsors the program, and he will take his place as a journeyman a year from now and serve that college for years to come. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our apprenticeship coordinator, Mr. Richard Gonzalez. Nice to meet you guys. He's, he's, unlike me, he's a man of few words, but his deeds <laughs> speak volumes. Okay, so this college is, in fact, accepts apprenticeships, and they also are heavy, heavy, heavy on safety. They do a lot of training, and it means a lot to me and the people of Crafts. And as you know, that's what we do here at Crafts. We want to recognize people who do wonderful things for the district, whether some people know it or not. Uh, is there a vice president of administration here with the initials of JL? Anybody? Oh, could it be over there? Yes. Oh. Well, I want to tell you something. No program at Gateway or any other college could succeed without the dedication of people in the administration. And here's one person through the years, and I've known of this person, and listened to what they, people have said that they've accomplished over the years. And I've got to tell you, I'm very impressed. And I want to thank this president, our vice president, in the only way we know how at Crafts, and that's a donation to student scholarships in the name of the Vice President of Administration at Gateway Community College, Janet Langley. Mm. You have no idea what this means to crafts, to have people uh, dedicate themselves to safety and furthering the apprenticeship. Also, Vice President Langley's done a wonderful job, but no Vice President could do that well of a job without the support of the college president. Therefore, on behalf of the Unified Crafts, we'd also like to make a donation in the name of student scholarships to Gateway Community College President, Dr. Giovannini. Where is it? Oh, he's over there. Sorry, that was his job, not mine. Now, I need to do, okay. Well, thanks, Rich. Guy, well, his deeds speak volumes, and I really appreciate his help. Now, here's, uh-oh, that's the wrong one. Uh-oh, got to trade you. So, anyways, so I'll move along. Uh, so... This person, uh, I want them to know that for many years I wanted to recognize them. Everybody knows who they are. Everybody knows what an excellent job their staff does. And this person, through their leadership, allows Maricopa actually to be here today. I have no doubt I dealt with this person for 10 years, and I think a straight shooter, wonderful person, very helpful and true and honest and a real benefit to Maricopa. Now, I sent an email three years ago saying I wanted to honor this person, but because of exigency and all these other things the guys in the group said, and the one lady said, well, I don't know, let's hold off. Well, the time to hold off is gone. It is my honor to recognize somebody, and especially the dedication of their staff, but through their leadership has done a great deal for this organization, and we couldn't do it without her. It is my honor on behalf of the Unified Crafts Association to recognize someone who's done an outstanding job and should be recognized much more often. Therefore, this student scholarship donation on behalf of Crafts is presented to the Vice Chancellor of Business Services, Debbie Thompson.
It's enough of me. Thank you for your time. <laughs> we, we would like to hear from you more often. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot. I have a challenge to all the policy groups. You know, we have like 50 people in our group, and like 40 of them pay dues. So there's no requirement to do that. But in the last year, I'm very proud of my organization because out of 40 people, we were able to amass $4,000 for student scholarships. Yeah, Next is Donna Winston. Yeah. <laughs> President Burke, members of the governing board, Chancellor Glasper, CEC, and guests. As you all know, I am Donna Winston. I am the All CPD Chair, which is Collaborative Policy Development for those of you who don't know. This team consists of Crafts, MO, MAT, PSA, and Public Safety employee group leaders. They also consist of administration, um, which we have been working, as you know, very hard on our new employee manual. However, I'm going to make this very short, sweet, simple, to the point. On behalf of All CPD, we want to thank you for approving the flex benefits for all the employees who receive such benefits. Second, we also want to thank you for considering the general salary adjustment for MCCD employees. We cannot even begin to tell you how vital and how important this will be for all employees' morale. MCCD has relied on its employees to serve not only our client, the students, or the community, but to each other as well. This increase would be greatly appreciated, and all CPD is asking the governing board to please consider the compensation salary adjustment for fiscal year 2012-2013. And we also want to thank Gay so much for getting all the information to all CPD um, because it really has helped us work uniformly utilizing the IBN process. So we're very excited, and we really, really thank you. Uh, we have, uh, I have three vice chancellor reports written here. Uh, Andrea Berman is reporting for Dr. Harper Marinick. Uh, President Burke, uh, members of the board, CEC, and the chancellor, I'm pleased to introduce three faculty members from Paradise Valley Community College, Sheila Afnon Manns, Reyes Medrano, Candace. Uh, Mickelson, who d will describe their project using open educational resources, which won a Community College Learning Resources Award from the American Librarian Association. Good evening. I'm Candace Michelson, library faculty from PVCC. With me is Sheila Afnon Manns, library faculty from SCC, and business faculty from PVCC Reyes Madrana. Thank you for letting us take this brief moment to share with you the award-winning Medrano project. In 1997, the California Community College District published a survey in which students stated that textbook costs were not only an economic but an academic barrier. It's interesting to note that 15 years later, a decade and a half later, many students would say that textbook costs are a barrier to their academic success. Maricopa is very fortunate in that a lot of faculty strive to cut those costs through the use of open educational resources, whether it's Merlot or flat, word, not flat world knowledge, which means zero textbook costs or very low textbook costs. Um, some faculty departments even pull their own resources and create their own repositories, once again, lowering costs for students. And while all of these are commendable um, and the impetus for the Madrano project, our project went one step further, and that is the fact that we were not the collectors of the information and therefore then giving the information to the students. Instead, what we did was we adopted a disruptive pedagogy, and we let the students be the content creators, the students be the content experts, and we were able to witness profound student engagement that lowered costs. Sheila's going to give a brief outline of the project. Yes, and we did um, give you um, a small packet that has some more details. Um, so this project actually was the winner of a national award given through the American Library Association, which was very exciting for us. Um, and it's true, as Candy was explaining, 
um, really for more than probably 10 years, um, the cost of textbooks has been discussed, um, you know, at district levels, at the national level. It's a growing problem that actually librarians, we witness this every day on the front lines at our reference desks where students come in desperate at times for um, a textbook that they can't afford when, you know, costs are exceeding $100, $150, sometimes more than the tuition. And so, rightfully so, um, we often think about open educational resources, OER, as a content replacement option. Um, so our library, or the library at Paradise Valley, where I was the last couple of years, um, we thought, well, gosh, we have actually some professional expertise to offer to this whole discourse because just by nature of our training, we're aware of um, all of the flourishing digital scholarship that's coming online every day. For example, at ASU right now, they're working on a wonderful institutional repository, and this trend will only continue to grow. Um, so. Um, what we, what we did as a library is we started to introduce workshops and um, different activities to work with faculty intimately on how to develop what we would call digital course packs, where we would work with faculty to cr uh, blend content from our databases that you all gener generously fund for us, the proprietary information, along with open access scholarship, and it becomes um, a seamless um, sort of it could be a textbook replacement or a textbook supplement for the students. Um, and so this, I think this idea was percolating around Paradise Valley, around the campus, and it, in the spring of 2010, the business division approached the library because I guess there was a textbook for a IBS, was it a 100 or 101 class that was exceptionally high, and they were wondering, could you work with us to find a replacement for this textbook? Um, so we were thinking about that, but it was when we started talking with Reyes Medrano directly that the big light, um, sort of light bulb went off. Why should we have to do all the work? If we actually, if librarians embedded ourselves in the class directly, very collaboratively, and teach the, the skills to the students, information literacy skills for how to find and evaluate information, how to curate it ethically in a copyright compliant manner, those students can actually go out and research the information themselves and put it together. So this is exactly what we experimented with. And um, sort of the nuts and bolts of it, Reyes would give a lecture, and the students would take notes, and they were working in teams. And based on the lecture theme, there would be sub-themes that each team was assigned to. And the students would then go out with the skills they've been shown by the librarians and research the various resources, library databases as well as open source material. And they would put that information together through a wiki in Blackboard. The following week, the teams would stand up in front of each other and actually teach, peer teach the content to each other while Professor Madrano would respond appropriately. And as Candy said, it was a very engaging experience. I think um, a couple of points. One thing is, it really was the adoption and the integration of information literacy skills that largely made this possible, as well as the flexibility of Professor Madrano. And it's also important to note, you know, this project has gotten some attention. And really, we didn't require anything that we don't already have. We didn't have to buy anything new. We were simply retooling the, um, the resources that we already invest in, but using them in a new way. And the um, results were really astounding. As one student said, one student said to us, you had to be engaged to survive. It was <laughs> impossible to not be engaged. And we have a short little clip that we, that we're, we can take you into the classroom and you can actually see this in action. Nobody checked on the sound. She's, she's pretty much saying you have to be more involved. <laughs> is the sound muted? It is. And Edgar's back there, but that's fine. So I'm just going to show you pretty much the groups working, and then I'll go ahead and bump this off. So you can see the groups really interacting within the class. So this would be a time when they're in their teams, they're putting their wikis together. And we encourage them to look for text, um, audio, data, various types of information that would really replicate a very interesting multimedia type textbook. And you can see an example of the, the wiki in Blackboard. <laughs> <laughs> I 
can give you lots of sound, but that's out. okay. I can. And, well, and I was going to say, so while it was very exciting for the students, and we missed a little bit of that because we didn't have the sound, it was also very, um, I think, yes. engaging for Professor Madrano, and he has spoken eloquently about that um, through various presentations we made. So I'm going to turn it over to you. And let him wrap us up with mm -hmm. his eloquence. <laughs> I've been here before, uh, usually to protest something you guys have done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I, the experience was, was just really enlightening. I just I was, to be honest with you, I was very surprised at, at the outcome. Uh, you know, we all strive as, as professors, uh, we all strive to engage our students. This is the natural setting for that. Uh, the students do the research, they put the, they put the information up on a wiki page and then post it on Blackboard. It, it's like a living textbook, it, it changes. Just to give you a quick example, uh, we were on the topic of uh, how, it's, it's, it's international business course, on the topic of how, the, how uh, theocracies are losing out to democracies worldwide. And as we're, we're on this topic uh, in, in the class, Egypt happens. Well, you're not going to find any more relevant uh, uh, information than uh, on, online in any textbook. So that, that was just just to give you one example how perfect the timing is and how how relevant it is to students, and uh, and not to not not to but the, not to uh, diminish the idea of, of relevancy and engagement. The cost factor. Come on, you know I had one textbook in my classes that cost two hundred and forty dollars for the text. That's ridiculous. We got to do something, and I think it's a national movement that has to has to gain impetus. And I hope uh, I hope as a district we start to look at it uh, in a more universal uh, manner and start try trying some of this stuff uh, district wide. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm amazed. I read a book recently called The Innovative University. And what you're doing, there are examples, uh, parallels of what you're doing in that book. Uh, and uh, so it is a disruptive innovation, and uh, I appreciate uh, this report very much. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, George uh, Kakajian in information, uh, information technology. Uh, President Burke, members of the board, I would like to invite to the board podium Mark Lyrie, faculty from South Mountain Community College uh, from the Department of Business Information System, and Jennifer Strickland, uh, the interim director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at Mesa Community College. Um, as you may recall, uh, we are moving forward with the Canvas uh, uh, product uh, for our learning management system, and as you requested, we're going to do an update report for you so you have a sense of how uh, well this is going. Uh, what I would like to emphasize here is that this is going to be a brief presentation with, uh, and please keep in mind that um, the, the role of uh, the Academic Technology Alliance uh, is playing very well in the governance model and this really connects the way we do business in Maricopa to uh, how IT does its business. So it's been a great partnership and I would like to um, uh, turn it over to them and I want to thank you in advance. Okay, thank you. President Lam. Governing board members, Chancellor Glasper, um, members of CEC, and distinguished guests. My name is Jennifer Strickland, and I am currently serving as a tri chair of the Learning Management Implementation Team, which is charged with um, basically leading a successful migration um, from Blackboard and WebCT to our new learning management system, which is Canvas, by the company called Instructure. I also currently am the Interim Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning at Mesa Community College, and so I'm here to talk to you about Mesa's transition um, from WebCT to Canvas thus far. So um, our transition really began in um, 2011 fall convocation. Now at that time the RFP had not been complete, and so um, we really emphasized the um, we, we, we at that time we were emphasizing basically the transition out of WebCT since we didn't know where we were going um, but we did want to start an awareness campaign so to speak so we we deemed WebCT as the Jurassic era of the learning management system which it really is and so we kind of just were trying to generate excitement about um, our, our future which will be very quickly upon us um, leaving the Jurassic era moving from WebCT to who knows what 
Um, spring 2011, com um, 2012 convocation is really when our migration kicked in. At that time, we were able to reveal the new learning management system called Canvas, and we embraced the concept of um, basically having the opportunity to have a, a blank canvas, and um, we really encouraged everyone to start creating their own masterpiece um, of teaching and learning in the online environment. So since then, the LMIT, in collaboration with the district IT and Mesa Community College, has been very busy. We created, um, well, we all had to get trained in Canvas ourselves. So we got trained in Canvas. We, we set up a production environment. We um, set up our testing environment. We, um, let's see, we began and established support documentations, processes, and procedures, and uh, rolling out, basically, training. So at Mesa, we have thus far offered 30, about 30 training um, workshops. We've offered 20 open labs approximately. Of these 50 learning opportunities, we've trained over 170 faculty in Canvas at this point. Um, we have 23 faculty who stepped up to be trained um, in Canvas to serve as faculty mentors. These are faculty who have decided they're really excited about our transition, and they're very excited about Canvas, and they are serving from spring, summer, and fall to um, basically train their peers in, in Canvas. So they're collaborating partners with us to help us with our migration process. It's really helped generate a, a lot of excitement. Um, we currently have 43 live courses of over 21 disciplines and um, close to 800 students in Canvas right now. We, um, some of the benefits that students that we've heard from faculty and students who love the system are that it's intuitive um, and easy grade book. So if you know anything about Blackboard or WebCT, those two adjectives were never used. Um, intuitive and easy grade book, it provides really many ways to communicate with students <coughs> and faculty. So at any point and any place in Canvas, faculty can create an audio comment or a video comment. So say they're grading an assignment, they can just click a little microphone button and they can record an audio message to the students. Likewise, students can reply to that assignment comment with an audio or video assignment. This can be done in announcements, it can be done in um, discussion board, it can be it, and pretty much anywhere in the system. Um, faculty love that. Um, it offers a consolidated calendar and to-do list and inbox. What this means is, um, if you've ever been in an online environment, you have five classes, you had to go five different places, now you just open up one calendar, everything's there. Your to-do list is right here on the right next to assignments that's coming up, and then it's all listed in a graphical interface of a calendar. It's really wonderful. It has something called um, predictive grading for, for future performance for students. So students can kind of say, this is where I'm at so far. What happens if I get a C on my final exam? What will my final grade be? They just can plug in numbers to find out and predict their future performance in the course. Um, it offers um, rubrics are essential to the system. Now, what's wonderful about rubrics is it's informative for the students, so there has clear, concise instructions on what they're doing for their assignments, so there's no ambiguity in what's expected of them. And then it helps also um, provide clear alignment to the course level module objectives and then the course competencies. So, um, and then it helps the faculty grade as well and ensure that they're meeting all of their course competencies. So basically, um, at thus far, we are loving the new system coming from WebCT. I don't think that's too much of a challenge, but um, we have embraced the we are going to paint our new canvas and create our own masterpiece, and we are looking forward to being able to um, create a seamless experience for all of our faculty and students with a one Maricopa experience. On behalf of the Academic Technology Alliance, I just want to congratulate Mesa for their hard work and, and, uh, and their work on innovation and moving us towards a one Maricopa goal. Any, yes, questions. Um, I'm, now, are we replacing Blackboard? What's the? What are we replacing? Here? Is it, it? It's not the email, right? It's the Blackboard. I'm, I don't understand what. Services work. Blackboard is what um, off all online courses, hybrid courses, and web enhanced courses are offered through a system called Blackboard. And um, Blackboard hasn't currently migrated thus far. Mesa has only. So Mesa is on WebCT, which is a Blackboard product, but not the same one. Mesa has always been on a separate learning management system. This is a new management, course management tool. 
Exactly. Right. Okay. That's in the I district, and, the, and we dealt with this how many months ago? Um, uh, Mr. President, members of the board, um, the board um, um, asked us to move forward uh, with the canvas, as you may recall, and um, and you wanted a report to make sure that the progress right. is uh, uh, going forward. The goal is to move rest of um, um, the uh, Blackboard um, colleges to that system as we're moving toward the one Maricopa vision. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the interim report. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to report that Mesa has done a fantastic job, and I uh, am very appreciative of the faculty's engagement in, in the process because that's where the work really is, the hard mm -hmm. work is. So thank you. How much training does um, do you need to be a trainer? Like tra you're doing train the trainer, right? Kind of work. Some of it's going to help the other people work. How much? How many hours are you? They the train the trainer. We went. We had them go through four hours of training. They train the trainer, but our average training is two hours. It's uh, about 90 minutes of learning Canvas, and then 30 minutes if you're migrating your course from WebCT to Canvas. Are, are you getting support from Canvas themselves, or? Do they take much involvement with from them, or is it? Yes, Canvas is amazing. They are very wonderful. Um, they're quick and responsive. Um, you know, Maricopa is, is is unique, for example, in um, the number of course competencies we have. We have over 10,000 course competencies in our bank, and we really want to get them all loaded into the system, so to speak. Um, and so Canvas has been really responsive. That's a very unique need in higher ed. Um, and they're and they're very responsive to all of our requests. Are they, for do assistance. they come here, or are you just doing online, or how do you? No, nope, Canvas trained all of us on the learning management implementation team. There was about I don't know maybe 30 of us. They came here and trained us, and then all of us we had representation from all the colleges, and then we all went to our campuses and then trained other people. Okay, but as far as support, it's still online, or do they come back? Periodically? No, they they or don't come. How um, do you do that? No, they haven't come back. Um, we haven't invited them back. <laughs> I'm sure they would if we invited them. Um, there is the InstructureCon conference. A lot of us will be going in June. And, um, but we are in constant email communication with them and phone conversation with them. Um, but the district, the learning management implementation team is really well. We're all trained and so we help support each other and troubleshoot and, and then create documentation based on that. Does that answer? Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> uh, Dr. Steve Helfgott, uh, Maricopa Foundation. <coughs> Excuse me, Mr. Burke. President Burke, members of the board, I'm pleased to report to the board briefly this evening on two items that appear to have me choked up. <laughs> <laughs> First let, <coughs> First, let me thank all of you who were present, present last Thursday for our seventh annual Heroes of Education dinner. <coughs> Honoring Lisa Budinger, you were part of a crowd of almost 500 from across our community who were two powerful and moving student speakers, as well as from our gracious honoree. This year's dinner netted another $100,000 to support student scholarship and to support programs that support student success and put us well on the road to our second million dollars in support coming from the Heroes Dinner Series. Secondly, earlier today it was our pleasure to host the Foundation's annual employee recognition event. In addition, <coughs> in addition to our own recognition activities, we are proud to partner with the Sony Corporation to recognize both deserving students and younger faculty members with technology packages from Sony, worth $1,100 each for the student packages and $2,300 each in the case of the faculty packages. Our Sony Student Award winners this year included Dita Webster from Phoenix College, Ty Liu from Glendale, Dwayne Hampton from PVCC, Julie Dawson and Juliana Martinez, both from South Mountain Community College. Each had an incredible story, and the laptop computers they received will have a huge impact on their ability to be successful students. Our Sony Faculty Award winners were Tawn Hauptel, Interim Director, Foundations for Student Success, and Residential Faculty Member at Mesa Community College, 
and Kelly Lambert, librarian and residential faculty member at South Mountain Community College for her work in student success. Our employee recognition recipients were equally as impressive and included one group and four individuals. Our first awardee was Equality Maricopa, represented by Lori Gershik, Dale Hauser, Roy Gilbert, and Jackie Starks for their work to get gender identity included in the district's non-discrimination policy. Also recognized was Amy McPherson, Chair of the Library and Teaching and Learning Center Division at South Mountain Community College for her leadership in preparing SMCC4 and moving them into their beautiful new library. Our third award went to Dr. Hank Mancini from PVCC for his work in filling the science pipeline from recruiting high school students in the sciences, engineering, and pre-med to getting them through the college and on to the university. Our fourth award went to South Mountain Community College's Raul Monreal in recognition of his nearly 38-year career as, among other things, a champion of students, of inclusion, and of diversity. Finally, we recognized for the second time Professor James Souza from Phoenix College for his remarkable creation of more than 1,850 math mini-lessons that are available on YouTube, not just to his students, but to students around the world, including those as far away as Namibia. We were pleased to have Mr. Burke, Mr. Saar, and Dr. Campbell with us for the event, and I'm sure you will all join with them and with us in congratulating these talented students, faculty, and staff. As I said at the Heroes Dinner last week, sometimes I really love my job. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. President, and that concludes my report. Uh, we have four college reports. Uh, Dr. Sean Pan at Mesa Community <coughs> College. Yes, uh, President Burke, members of the Governing Board, Chancellor Glasper, fellow CC members and guests. At our district, when we talk about student success, we not only talk about academic success, we really also mean student development, the leadership development, involvement beyond the classroom. Uh, Phi Delta Kappa International Honor Society, I think it exists in all community college campuses in Maricopa. Mesa Community College, we have an outstanding chapter, Omicron Beta, uh, and as advisement of Dwayne Oaks, uh, this five-star chapter has done outstanding work for many, many years. This past semester, they participated in Arizona Regional a competition brought home just a slew of wonderful awards uh, indicative of their success, their participation, application of what they learned in the classroom in solve real community problems. Let me invite Dwayne Oaks and the uh, executive officers of Phi Delta Kappa of Mesa Community College to give a presentation. Thank you, President Burke, members of the Governing Board, Dr. Glasper, college presidents, and members of the community. Thank you all for allowing us to share our achievements with you this evening. My name is Heather Thomas, and I am the chapter president of the Omicron Beta chapter at Mesa Community College. With me tonight, I also have Saba Zar. He is also a, an executive board officer, um, as, well, as well as a regional vice president for the Arizona region. Phi Theta Kappa is the honor society for the two-year colleges. Its mission is twofold. First, to recognize and encourage academic achievement of two-year college students, and second, to provide opportunities for individual growth and development through participation in honors, leadership, service, and fellowship programming. I have been part of the chapter for about two and a half years now, and I can tell you that I've been involved in so many projects that it's just unbelievable. I've had so many opportunities to become a better leader in my community on my campus. This year, under my leadership and with the help of many dedicated and hardworking student members, we have made an enormous impact on our college and our, and our community. Tonight, I would like to share these achievements with you. Let me start by explaining the projects that we, we took leadership in this year. First, 
our, our college project, the C4 Community College Completion Co Goal, or Core, excuse me. Our goal was to raise awareness on campus to the college completion rates. We gave presentations and classes during or student orientations, during our induction ceremonies, um, and other clubs and organizations on campus trying to promote the college completion initiative. We collected student signatures from students all over campus, um, mostly by way of a huge wall that we um, painted in and display actually in the Paul Eisner Library at the Mesa Community College as of right now. Um, we've gotten students connected to clubs, organizations, and departments on campus. So basically we, we were there to help students connect to the departments that they needed to in order for them to be successful. We got, as, we got many students involved in the completion core as possible to help spread the initiative. Here's a, here's a picture of the wall that I was just talking to you about. <laughs> We negotiated, we negotiated with facilities on campus and our college pres uh, president, Dr. Pan, to allow us for space to advertise for the college completion initiative. We were given a temporary wall to paint and use it that was in the, uh, located in the Kirk Center while they were building the new student government office. Um, students gathered around, we painted the wall, and adding the C4 logo and the commit to completion. And later that evening, we held a ribbon cutting ceremony with administrators and Dr. Rod Risley, CEO of Phi Theta Kappa International. The wall was relocated to a central location in the library for students to see and remind them all year long of their commitment that they have made to being successful. So as far as our achievements, we've had articles written inside higher education, USA Today, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the Association of Community Colleges Journal, all promoting college completion. We created a video through Mesa Community College Media that's located on that, that link right there for promoting college completion. The video was actually placed on the, the main website of the, college complete, the C4 College Completion Initiative for students to see all over the nation. Um, and recently, I was just published in a book th from a actual um, a student that was a Jack Kent Cook Scholar from Florida who is now promoting college completion and college success and just wrote a book on college completion and I had an honor to have a chapter written and published in there. So this is part of our completion core. We even created and designed our own t-shirts so when we're running around campus in the bright green that people know exactly who they can come to if they need anything at all. Second is our Honors in Action project. Phi Theta Kappa is real big on, big on researching, finding a need, taking the lead, and doing the deed in our community. So for our Honors in Action project, we did what we called Operation Read. Our goals were to collect 450 books, bring awareness to the low literacy rates in Mesa, Arizona to students on campus and people in the community, collaborate with clubs on campus to help us raise these books, donate books to a local school that needed books, and to raise money to purchase new books. We beat our goal by 300 books. We raised over 750 books in the fall semester. We donated the books to the Mesa Arts Academy. And in, in addition, we took 30 students over to the K-8 school and we read and shared our college experiences with them. We raised over $450 to purchase additional books by collaborating with uh, Bookman's, old, or Bookman's Used Books and Village Inn. They helped to donate money. We also collaborated with our college football team where every single football player dedicated a book to a child and wrote a special message inside the book just letting them know that somebody cares. Um, in addition, on homecoming day football game, we, the, the football players actually came onto the field and donated the books right there into a special bin with the children. So it was a great occasion. So on to our, our awards now. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the projects so when I talk about the awards, you know what I'm talking about when I say honors in action or college project. So we had our this year region awards, which Mesa Community College hosted this year's regional event, which turned out really awesome. And we won, whoops, sorry. We won the most distinguished chapter in the state of Arizona. We won the most distinguished officer team in the state of Arizona. The most distinguished member was Mitza Contreras. Most distinguished officer, honorable mention, Lexi Harvey. Our college project, the C4 project, came in first place in the state of Arizona. Our Honors in Action Award for Operation Read, issue number five was education. We came in first place in the state of Arizona. 
We were honorable mention in the Operation Read for as far as the overall Honors in Action project, and Dwayne Oaks won our Continued Excellence Advisor Award. These are pictures of the awards we went. We had too many to bring, so we couldn't bring them all. <laughs> so now that we've competed regionally, we go on and we competed internationally. Last couple weeks ago, a group of us went to Nashville, Tennessee for our international convention. And so now we compete nationally with over 1,200 chapters in the nation. Our chapter took home one of 28 awards out of 1,200 in the chapters for the most distinguished chapter. This is a combination of our scores of both the Honors in Action and the College Project. So basically we write these essays on all these projects at the end of the year and they score them and so the average of the two projects together is what won us that award. So we were one of 28 out of 1,200 in the nation. We also took home one of 30 awards for the most distinguished officer team. There's 11 of us on the executive board. We took home one of 30 out of 1,200 in the nation. This is the second year this award has been here, been introduced, and we actually took it home the last two years in a row. Our, mit, our member, Mitza Contreras, also one most distinguished member. And Dr. Pan, I had the privilege of knowing Dr. Pan now for the last couple of years and getting to know him, and we actually nominated him this year for the Shirley B. Gordon Award of Distinction, which basically recognizes college presidents for their, for their collaboration, <laughs> their involvement, and their dedication to Phi Theta Kappa on campus. Dr. Pan was, had the pleasure of receiving, receiving an award, and yes, he went to Nashville with us. <laughs> and so he placed it for that. And then again, Dwayne Oaks are, won the Continued Excellence Award at the, at the international level. So just a real quick couple pictures of us receiving our awards. It's kind of like the Grammys. You get to go up there in front of 5,000 people, <laughs> so it is a real big thing. Uh, only four of the 11 officers got to travel because of budget cuts and stuff, but this four of the 11 were able to receive the award for the team. Our member with Dr. Pan. Dr. Pan receiving his award up stage with Dr. Rod Risley, who is also going to be our graduation speaker on, and will be speaking on college completion at graduation on May 11th. Dwayne. <laughs> Uh, we also have two students serving as regional uh, vice presidents and presidents. Dr. Uh, Dwayne Devin Oaks is our uh, newly elected regional president for Phi Theta Kappa, and Sabazar is our newly elected vice president of finance for the Arizona region. So then another good thing came out of it. So the Omicron Beta came in third place in the nation for raising the most money through Relay for Life for, for Phi Theta Kappa, through Phi Theta Kappa. We raised over $6,500 for Relay for Life last year. I'm glad to say that after Relay for Life last year, we have beat that number already. We're over $7,000 in counting still as of today. So, so we were nominated, or we, we basically are one of top 40 chapters in the nation with over 1,200 chapters, keep in mind. And that's the end of the slideshow real quick. I just wanted to thank you very much for taking the time to let us share our achievements with you. Um, I'm proud to be a student of Mesa Community College, and as I leave here this year, I hope to share my knowledge and my wisdom to many of the students that are taking my place and moving on. And I think that even next year, we actually just held our elections today, and this is the first year ever in history we had over 19 students apply for an off executive board positions on our board. And so this is going to show with 556 new members this year that Phi Theta Kappa makes a difference. Thank you very much. Well, this is the second time tonight we've heard students talk about one of the governing board members' goals, or not the governing board members, but the governing board's goals, and that is completion. So happy to, happy to see those activities. I love the idea about the uh, Student Success Pledge. That was, that was awesome. That was really well, all the other work you do, too. Is really awesome presentation. Good job. Uh, next, we have Dr. Irene Kovla from uh, Glendale Community College. And Dr. Linda Luham. We're doing this in tandem. Together? Yes. Okay. <coughs> I had you next. <laughs> <laughs> President for Governing Board Members, Chancellor Glasper, CEC colleagues and guests, we're pleased to announce that Chandler Gilbert Community College and Glendale Community College are finalists in the Second Nature Climate Leadership Awards. As we know, the district and its colleges are signatories to the American Colleges and University Presidents Campus Climate Commitment, 
So any one of the colleges in this room would be eligible for the award, and we are doing many amazing things in this district to support sustainability and to reduce our, our carbon footprint. These particular awards highlight uh, campus innovation and climate leadership and are chosen through a nomination process. Nominated institutions are selected in five Carnegie classification institution types. There were five nominees in the doctorate category, four in the master's college and university category, four in the baccalaureate college category, and four in the special focus college category. And in the associate degree and tribal college category, Chandler Gilbert Community College, Glendale Community College, Austin Community College District, and Haywood Community College in North Carolina were nominated. Nominations were invited, as Dr. Luhan said, from any of our climate commitment signatory institutions for their academic and curricular initiatives, institutional efficiency, and innovative financing that are being used to adapt the climate and reduce our carbon footprint. Finalists were selected in December 2011 and featured in a public video voting forum on planetforward.org during the spring uh, semester. Award winners will be announced and recognized at the ACU PCC Climate Leadership Summit June uh, 2012, hosted by American University in Washington, D.C. And I'm pleased to announce that ahead of that finalist category, Glendale Community College was the winner of the Associate and Tribal Colleges video competition. Mm. Now to show us these two videos are two of our distinguished faculty members, Dr. Pushpa Ramakrishma from, from Chandler Gilbert and Polly Lavak from Glendale Community College, as well as two of our incredible students from Chandler Gilbert, Scott Cecil, and from GCC, Katie Delphin. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Pushpa Ramakrishna. Scott Cecil went to a Model UN conference in San Francisco, and he's not back yet, and I kept calling him, and <laughs> so I guess he's not back yet. I hope he's not. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, I'll be presenting on his behalf, too. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Luhan for her leadership at, at, in this very important initiative for us. And she was one of the reasons that we were one of the top finalists for the award. And really want to thank you for all your support and encouragement on behalf of our campus. Um, it is exciting times to be working in sustainability, especially at Chandler Gilbert. Um, it's such a, a vibrant college full of people who are passionate and enthusiastic about sustainability. People from all employee groups, we all come together, we work together, uh, trying to make change, change at our three campuses, change in our community, change in our students' lives. That's what really uh, motivates us as employees at Chandler Gilbert. Um, one of the foremost things that helped um, us in this initiative is the fact that we recognized global learning and sustainability as one of the college goals in our strategic plan. And also we put in civic engagement and community engagement. As a result of which, the spearheaded sustainability programs across the campus, whether we are talking about curricular issues, uh, such as you know, how do you incorporate sustainability in the different disciplines, how are we going to create innovative pedagogy where faculty come together from diverse disciplines, try to co-teach, create learning communities. It's really uh, exciting to be uh, at the forefront of sustainability on all these issues at our campus. The other important thing is we have a huge co-curricular program. And as a result, we have many renowned speakers come to our campus. Uh, we have service learning programs with our towns and cities around. And also, we have student club heat. And I guess Scott did not make it. I, was, I kept looking from there, hoping he would come. And uh, so he's the president of heat club. And they have uh, actually 
uh, incorporated a lot of these sustainability measures across the campus to promote learning. And they are students, and yet, you know, they are, they are so cool. They created a panel discussion, invited people, and it was like attending a class almost with students running it. And uh, they are amazing students out there at our campus. Um, and so when you look at it from a curriculum perspective or from a student group perspective, it takes sustainability to another level. And then we have the brand new lead buildings and then using sustainable practices in all parts of our campus operations. So it's across the board. In fact, David Orr has said that higher education institutions are crucibles for learning about sustainability. And I feel our campus is trying to embody his saying. Uh, as, as educators, we feel that it is almost imperative for us to um, you know, excite our students and make them inform citizens about sustainability so that they go to the next level, they become the future uh, leaders of the society, and they bring about change. Change for uh, you know, protecting our environment and saving our resources for future generations. Uh, change to create societies where we have people of all types of races, ethnicities, and gender come together and live together and have good quality of life. That is what we try to embody. And students such as Katie and Scott and a whole bunch of students from all our campuses, you know, they are the motivating factors and they make our jobs uh, easy to do uh, in order to bring about change. Maybe, would you like to share? Deer in the headlight look. We're still having some audio problems. Should I try again? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause it and look at the big one. These are a group of engineering students uh, who created this video, and it's really neat. It's from an engineering perspective. <laughs> Should be up. I made it high. All right. Let's see. This is home, haunted every memory was created. But in the last century, humans have managed to destroy this home, with pollution and global warming reaching record highs. Here at Chandler Gilbert Community College, we recognize that we need to take the initiative to reverse the damage we have caused. We need to go green. It can start in very simple ways. At Chandler Gilbert, students are educated so they understand the importance of sustainability and human actions. They participate in design projects involving solar energy and visit solar power plants. Our campus is taking action with different conservation methods. We conserve electricity through the use of solar panels, automatic motion sensors for classroom lights, tinted windows for classrooms facing direct sunlight, and high-efficiency hand dryers. 
In addition, we focus on conserving precious water. With the implementation of desert landscapes and artificial turf. High efficiency faucets that use 87.5% less water than conventional faucets. Many of our buildings are LEED certified and use renewable material that reduce our reliance on petroleum and fossil fuels. In addition, the sustainable thinking during the construction of Ironwood Hall prevented 339 tons of waste from being deposited in landfills. No matter how big or small your actions are, change can start with you. The time has come to ask yourself, if not me, who? If not now, when? Thank you. <laughs> and here is Polly from Kennedy. President, Chancellor, and board and guests, thank you for having us. Uh, we are here to represent Glendale Community College. I am Katie Delphine, and I am a member of the First Year Experience Club. This is Polly Lava. She's an adjunct instructor from the psychology department. Starting as early as the 1990s, we had several individual efforts taking place on our campus that supported sustainability. In 2007, though, inspired by the NCLI Global Sustainability Dialogue Day, a handful of faculty and staff members came back and created green efforts. Today, we have more than 40 different initiatives taking place on our campus, which the video will highlight some of, and we have students, staff, faculty, and administration all participating. We believe that our success is primarily because we lead by example. Polly is right. Polly was my psychology teacher, and when we talked about environmental psychology, we talked about recycling and the environment. And then some days, even, we would walk into class and she would be digging through the trash can, pulling things out that were meant to be in the recycle bin. Uh, it's like they say, if you're going to talk the talk, you better walk the walk. Uh, having a teacher who is passionate about something makes it really easy for students to be inspired and get involved. In February, our club, the FYE club, presented at the largest collegiate leadership conference in the U.S. and we talked about how students can create a more sustainable campus. So not only are students active at GCC, we are also becoming leaders in sustainability amongst our peers. So we've read the climate action plans that have been submitted by the other Maricopa colleges and we're actually going to integrate several of the concepts that they have. And, in addition, under the fantastic leadership of our president, Dr. Irene Kovala, who is so incredibly encouraging and supportive of green efforts, we have some innovative ideas of our own that we plan to incorporate. So be sure to keep your eye on us. We are intending to continue to lead green. So we're going to show our video, and I hope you enjoy it.
Thank you. Um, let's see. Next is uh, Paul Dale from uh, Paradise Valley Community College. Uh, President Burke, I thought you were kidding about the midnight stop time. But <laughs> maybe that's not true. President Burke, members of the governing board, Chancellor Glasper, colleagues and guests. In 1998, Paradise Valley Community College began its journey to become a more learning-centered college. We purposely took a systems thinking approach by which our focus was not only on student learning but on employee and organizational learning as well. To this end, we initiated a robust employee and organizational learning team. And over the years, our ENOLT, ENOLT team has provided significant professional development opportunities for our faculty and staff. It is my belief that our commitment to employee and organizational learning has substantially contributed to increased student learning and success at Paradise Valley Community College. Here tonight to introduce a brief, I emphasize brief, a presentation on our employee and organizational learning effort is Dr. Mary Lou, Dr. Mary Lou Mosley, Vice President of Academic Affairs. Mary Lou. Thank you, Paul. President Burke, members of the Governing Board, Chancellor Glasper, um, members of CEC, and guests. It's my pleasure to tell you just a little bit about employee and organizational learning, which is our umbrella for learning across the college at Paradise Valley Community College. At um, Paradise Valley, we have faculty and staff development. We have adjunct faculty development. We have wellness initiatives and diversity initiatives gathered together under employee and organizational learning. It creates a synergy that impacts learning across the campus, so it's not um, specialized to just one group. I'm pleased to introduce Michelle Shadburn, who's our Manager of Organizational Development, and she will give you some highlights of our program. Governing Board President Burke, Governing Board members, Chancellor Glasper, CEC colleagues, and our dwindling guests. <laughs> <laughs> I have provided a handout for your perusal, and I promise you this will be a three-minute informative speech. Dr. Dale, thank you. Dr. Mosley, thank you. I take extreme pride in working for an organization where there is value and importance placed on employee development. Student learning and success is enhanced by the continuous development of the employee and the organization. I will now speak about some of the PVCC employee and organizational learning, what we call ENOL, programs and recent accomplishments. ENOL was created in 1998, the same year that PVCC started the conversation about becoming a more learning center college. Also in 1998, Learning Week was started during Faculty Accountability Week at the start of the fall and spring semesters. This conference-style learning format features employees sharing their learning, research, or new initiatives connected to the college's strategic goals and objectives. A few special events have been held featuring speakers such as Peter Senge, Robert Barr, Dr. Kay McClenney, and Dr. Michael Behrens from TGen. To date, I am pleased to share that I have organized close to 800 sessions with an attendance count of over 11,000. Another program that I share with you is PVCC's Adjunct Faculty Initiative, started in 2001 to focus on the specific needs of our adjunct faculty population. A new employer orientation that focused on the Learning Center College philosophy was developed. To date, 900 new adjunct faculty have attended. In 2009, I was charged by Dr. Dale and Dr. Mosley to create a program to provide additional support to our new adjunct faculty. Part one of the program, Ready, Set, Go, is a paid four-hour session to help the new adjunct faculty member prepare for and successfully complete their first week of class. A supporting web page was also developed. 150 new adjunct faculty have participated. Part two of the program, Edge, is a hybrid learning community that combines four in-class sessions with outside work hosted in a learning management system and is focused on assessment, classroom management, and engaged learning strategies. To date, we have had 53 adjunct faculty members complete this paid learning opportunity. Please note, both employee and organizational learning and the adjunct faculty initiative were former recipients of PVCC's Innovation of the Year Award, and Ready, Set, Go and Edge were recipients of two Maricopa Adjunct Faculty Association Best Practices Award. I am also pleased to share that the 2011 Community College of Student Engagement, SESI as we know it, score in active and collaborative learning as responded to by our students places PVCC almost three percentile points above the SESI cohort, 
and also marks an almost 5 percent percentile point increase from survey results taken in 2005. Lastly, the Center for Teaching and Learning opened in 2011. Thank you for your support of employee learning and for your interest as we share with you how employee and organizational learning at Paradise Valley Community College has been structured to support our journey to become a more learning-centered college. And I look forward to future disruptive innovation mm -hmm. opportunities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other uh, reports from vice chancellors or college presidents? Nice job. I like the um, paid for adjunct training. I think it's pretty important to bring them there and not expect them to show up for free. And uh, but I think that, that shows a, a, a support on their part and, and including them and training them. I, I applaud you for that. Nice report. <clears throat> um, and we're in the external community, uh, the AADGB report. Uh, our board is meeting on June 11 here in uh, this area. Uh, but other than that, I have no report. ASBA report, uh, Mr. Starr. The chancellor, myself, and others are going to meet with the ASBA officers and administrators in the next couple of weeks to discuss how better to handle developmental education and another uh, of an, another um, several other. Uh, P20 issues that are on the drawing board. So we look forward to that meeting and coming back to you at our next annual, our next monthly meeting and give you some results. Uh, legislative update, uh, Patricia Hill. Good evening. President Burke, members of the board, Chancellor Glasper, members of CEC and all others present, I'm here to provide you with a brief legislative update. Today is the 107th day of the legislative session, and the legislature did fail to meet its adjournment by the 100th day of the legislative, uh, our, of our legislative session. How soon they will ultimately adjourn is going to depend upon when they're able to come to an agreement on the budget. In terms of the legislative process, of the 1,395 1, bills posted, the legislature has currently passed 326 of them. The governor has signed 287 bills and vetoed 18. Uh, the two chambers also have 21 bills remaining, and those are the bills that are currently being held uh, pending the legislature sending a budget up to the governor. The governor has indicated that she is going to veto bills that come up to her desk until the legislature provides her with a budget. With respect to job training, House Bill 2815, Employment Incentives Regulatory Tax Credit, continues to await Senate action. Uh, amendments to key provisions of the bill uh, are expected, but we don't know any detail at this point. The job training issue may be addressed via the establishment of a study committee that will look at a means by which to better involve uh, community colleges and other entities in the job training activities in our state. Guns on campus, legislation to allow the guns on campus does appear unlikely to move forward uh, this session, particularly in light of the governor's veto of House Bill 2729. And that was the legislation that would have allowed increased uh, access by individuals who are carrying handguns into public buildings um, unless they had metal detectors or security. And the governor was very clear in her veto message uh, regarding the, the weapons in public buildings. So we believe that that also bodes well for the guns on campus issue. Budget negotiations between the House and the Senate, between the legislature and the governor continue, and we will keep you updated as those negotiations uh, reach some sort of a resolution. So with that, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Questions? Ms. Hill. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> uh, I do have a request for a recess, and we will now take a 10-minute recess. <clears throat> the. Uh, the governing board meeting of April 24, 2012 is now back in session. We are <clears throat> uh, at the point of approving the agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. All right. Dr. Campbell moves. Uh, Mr. Sarr seconds uh, the motion to approve the agenda. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, I will entertain a motion on the consent agenda. Is Does anyone wish to remove any items from the consent agenda? I would. I'd like to remove um, Lori Sullivan Gilman and just see if, give her a little more time to see if we can 
find a position. I know she's in a difficult job category. Let's have a motion. Is there a second to the motion? Second. There's a motion and second to remove Lori Sullivan's name from the agenda. Is there a discussion? Mr. Chair, members of the board, the only comment I would like to make is that absent this presentation, I would have really appreciated it if Mrs. Sullivan had come to me even prior to this board meeting, I mean, even after the notice that she received. If she states that there are some issues that need to be addressed, I just would go on the record and ask that they follow protocol. Ms. Jackson, do you have a comment? No. Ms. Jackson. Mr. President, members of the board, I'd have to echo our Chancellor's sentiment. The process by which positions and programs are determined for purposes of layoff is set by policy, and in this instance and other instances that have been brought forward to this board, they have been vetted internally through the appropriate protocols and supported by HR. And in my mind, in this instance, both HR, district, and local leadership have met its obligation, both procedurally and otherwise, with regard to our responsibilities and duties to help Ms. Sullivan find an opportunity. As a matter of fact, by policy, the notice requirement, I believe the six weeks notice that we are required to give notice to employees, PSA employees who are to be laid off, in this instance, Ms. Sullivan has been given a seven and a half month notice for the purpose of affording her every opportunity to find an opportunity inside of the organization. As she has noted, she does have a very unique skill set, one that is very niched and is very difficult to find an opportunity for placement for her, given that niche. That has not been without effort, however. By her own statement, she's had 11 interviews, and many of those have been the result of a joint effort between her searches and the searches performed by my office. So I'm somewhat at a loss, to be blunt, not quite sure what else we could have done in this situation from an assistance standpoint to assure her an opportunity to find a role within the organization. And so as difficult as it is, and I certainly understand her sentiment and the unrest associated with an impending job loss from a procedural standpoint, I'm not sure that there's much else that we could have done or could do. Any other board member have a comment? Mr. I would just like to echo the position that she has asked for in seeking to have and receive some training, additional training or other training. And so that is why I'm going to support this motion. Motion is to remove her name from the consent agenda. Are you ready to vote? Yes. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Let's see. I'm going to do a roll call. Dr. Campbell? Yes. Yes. Mr. Lum? Aye. Ms. Pearson? Yes. Aye. Me. Okay. I vote no as well. Motion passes three to two. I will now entertain a motion to pass the consent agenda. So moved. Dr. Campbell moves and Mr. Lum seconds a motion to pass the consent agenda. All those, any discussion? All those, yes. As amended. Yes. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion passes unanimously. Now I need, let's see, Mr. Combs, what's the process now? Do we refer this issue to HR? I don't think we're ready to discuss a personnel issue right now. The policy says, the agenda says, that the item removed from the consent agenda will be acted upon in the non-consent agenda. So we'll have to remember that there is this item to 
act on, either accept or reject formally uh, the uh, termination record. Okay. Uh, it issues. Um, The, the timing is the issue. Do we uh, do we do that tonight? Do we? Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll make a motion that um, we delay the vote on on suspension of Lori um, Sullivan to next month. There is a motion to postpone the decision uh, regarding Lori Sullivan until the uh, May meeting. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Dr. Campbell seconds the motion. Any discussion? I just am concerned that if four weeks is enough to um, uh, give everybody involved an opportunity to look at seeing what, I, I don't know of a training program that can be accomplished in four weeks, let alone a planning, a discussion, uh, efforts to make decisions and then schedule that training, let alone hold the training. So I'm kind of concerned and so I would like to offer a substitute motion that in the uh, May uh, meeting or executive session we have a, an update or discussion as to how things have progressed or what the decision may be and that we have that opportunity as a board to meet with Dr. Glasper and Nikki, uh, Ms. Jackson to discuss this as to what we need to do before we make that decision. I second. Uh, well, let's see. If I understand your motion correctly, you're referring this to administration to come back with a recommendation. Is that For the case? May executive session. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Uh, there is a uh, there is a substitute motion. And there, a second, Mr. Lumsdale. Yes, I. There's a substitute motion and a second to refer uh, the personnel issue to administration for a recommendation. All of those uh, in favor of the substitute motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, one uh, no. The motion carries. Uh, all right. The, uh, we are now at the, uh, uh, to item six on the agenda. Uh, the first is the approval of a preliminary proposed uh, 1213 budget. Uh, Ms. Thompson, would you care to comment? Mr. President, members of the board, um, we are pretty far along into our budget process. We're seeking tonight uh, approval of the preliminary proposed budget. We'll be coming back next month following publication of our budget as required by statute um, and seeking final approval of our budget. Uh, so in about a month's time, that will be the final time we'll be bringing the budget forward. Gay Murphy does have a very brief pr presentation, building on presentations that she has made in the last couple of months about our budget. So I'd ask her to share that presentation. Thank you very much. President Burke, governing board members, Chancellor Glasper, CEC members, and audience members. I have a very brief presentation on the budget. Uh, this is uh, the budget being considered for approval tonight. Uh, approval uh, uh, this evening will give us the, uh, the authority to, to publish the budget in the newspaper, to have it posted on our website uh, as required by law before we come back to you for formal budget adoption, final budget adoption, uh, at our next meeting. So, in, in summary, our budget proposed for next year is about $160 million. Our operating uh, budget is, is basically flat. Uh, the largest increase we're looking towards is an increase in our capital funds related to a planned sale of bonds uh, and an increase in our restricted fund related to uh, an increase uh, potentially in financial aid. Um, for our general operating fund, we're looking at potentially having $23 million available for allocation next year. Most of this, though, will come from reallocations. Uh, we have uh, projected some additional construction, uh, additional funds and property taxes coming from new construction added to the tax rolls. Uh, and we're having to take an offset because we use some one-time monies uh, to balance the budget this year. We're not looking at a tuition increase, and we're also not looking at an increase in the tax levy on existing property. So we do have some new property added to the tax rolls, but not on existing property. 
Uh, in terms of uses, we have sufficient resources to cover all of our mandatory costs, and we're looking at uh, having uh, potentially funds available for uh, uh, a high priority um, uh, uh, student success or compensation or initiative of the board's choice. Uh, in terms of the budget, we have to balance the budget. Uh, we're starting this year with sort of a hole in that uh, we balanced uh, the current year's budget with one-time resources. So now that we've spent them, we'll have to identify a permanent ongoing source of funds uh, for about $10.7 million uh, of our operating budget. And we've done that mostly through looking at internal cuts uh, which we've been, the colleges and the governing, or the colleges and the district office have been working since uh, early last fall to identify options uh, for making budget cuts to implement next year. We've been looking for ways to reallocate funds um, so that we'll have resources uh, to move forward. Uh, again, looking at some uh, resources from uh, property tax on new construction and uh, 1.4 million in uh, state aid. In terms of uses, uh, looking at uh, covering mandatory costs, uh, those are covered in statute or in policy, such as the presidential scholarships, employee retirement benefits, and the like. Uh, the governing board approved the flex benefits increases, uh, mostly related to an increase in health insurance. And again, there is uh, resources available for initiatives. Uh, and or compensation. Uh, for our auxiliary funds, uh, those are mostly uh, self-supporting fee-for-service activities, including our skill centers, non-credit activities, and our restricted fund uh, uh, is for funds that we, uh, we don't really have any choice about how we use them. They're restricted in use. Uh, most of this is from um, federal Pell grants for financial aid for our students. Uh, we may get other grants or gifts, and that would go through our restricted fund. But most of it, uh, Maricopa is for financial aid that goes directly passed through to our students. Um, our largest increase will be for our plant fund. Uh, we're looking at about $105 million increase uh, related to the sale of general obligation bonds. This will be our last sale, Series E. Uh, through our uh, 2004 capital development program. Uh, we're looking at a continuation of transfers from our operating budget to our capital budget because of the loss of state aid that provided support for equipment uh, and other capital needs. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yes, sir. And there's lots of reasons for the difference in the budget from the ability to do some additional funding that we weren't past, but I'm just going to pick one of them for time reasons. Um, we, we've got a wellness program. I think that's working. And I think it's worth talking just briefly about the fact that our K-12 school districts are looking at anywhere from a 10 to 15 percent increase in, in health care costs, in and the private sector as well. We're looking at 3.9. There's got to be some reasons. Now, obviously, we the catastrophic illnesses are part of that. But I think also it's worth noting that our wellness activities throughout the district are starting to show results. Um, we're healthier. We're not having the Ill illnesses that require our self-funded programs to cover. And I think uh, it's a good momentum builder. I think we need to continue building that momentum. We've had discussions about mm -hmm. um, how to do that. And I, I commend the wellness people involved and, and the whole staff, really, for taking uh, us up. On, on wellness, whether it's losing weight, stopping smoking, uh, and a number of other things, the walking that people are doing under the programs they've set up, I just commend them for making it all happen. Absolutely. Is the um, transference of um, monies from, I don't remember the, different, the two different budgets, into um, facilities, into um, plant monies, does this make our administration costs look bigger as we compare administration to salaries, is that? Um, Mr. Lum, Mr. President, Mr. Lum, um, not necessarily. Um, it would be a lot of times what we'll see is um, if colleges have vacancy savings 
or they may be able to have savings throughout the year that they'll identify and then transfer um, to uh, uh, the plant fund where we have to make the capital purchases. Or they'll save for uh, large purchases in the future. Now, Mr. Lum, uh, members of the board, the, the transfer from uh, the general fund to the capital fund uh, is not included, capital fund is not included in, in the calculation of administrative costs for the no. system because it's capital dollars. Right. Uh, I would like to comment, if I may, though. Uh, Ms. Murphy mentioned a couple of times about the one-time resources of 10.7. I just would like to go on the record again by reminding the board that those were stimulus dollars provided to us from the federal government, so those were planned one-time uses with always an intent to replace those with permanent. Remember, we were guaranteed the funding level of 2008, so we are still transitioning. And it, it allowed us to transition and to reduce our budgets in a more systemized fashion rather than have to just uh, take immediate reductions three years ago. Any other questions? Oh, All right. Uh, Dr. Campbell moves. Uh, well, actually, this is just uh, uh, we're approving. Is this a motion? Yes. We're approving a preliminary budget. All right. Dr. Campbell moves. Second. Mr. Sarr seconds the approval of a preliminary proposed FY 12 13 budget. Uh, is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, item two is the approval of purchase of three buildings and land located at 2250 West 14th Street and 1335 and 1325 South Park Lane, Tempe, Arizona. Uh, Ms. Thompson. Mr. President, members of the board, uh, we are recommending that the district purchase these three buildings. It's approximately 24,000 square feet right across the street from Rio Salado for slightly less than $2 million plus closing costs, and it will allow Rio Salado and the district office to expand into the future in this same campus area. So these will be part of Rio or you know, separated into different divisions? Like um, Mr. President, Mr. Saar, members of the board, uh, Rio will occupy some of the space for sure. Their dental program they've spoken about at times. There are some uh, offices that they've already identified that they'd like to move across the street. Uh, we are starting to talk about shared services and some collaborative efforts that would then free up space in really the tower buildings and the Emerald Point and also um, the Hohokam building. So we're, we're in discussions about what will go and how we can work more collaboratively together. Any other question? I'm, I'm moving. I'm moving. We approve this motion. Thank you. Mr. Lum uh, moves and Mr. Starr seconds approval of the uh, purchase of three buildings. Um, uh, 2250 West 14th Street, 1335, 1325 South Park Lane in Tempe. Um, any other discussion? I just want to say that we've purchased a lot of property here in the last couple of years, but it's in the favor of our, time to buy. our taxpayers. We, we couldn't have found a better time to have money and a need for the building. Mm -hmm. um, we, we were, we were going to have to buy them or build them somewhere down the line. We're, we're just in a good position to take advantage of the times as we know so I, I really appreciate the work that staff has done to find these and to um, uh, the, the long term uh, efforts of the district to have the funds in place to buy them. Yeah I agree with what's being said but I also like to remind you that's the reason why some years ago we took an issue to the public of 904 million dollars which they approved by 70 percent and we're still using those funds if I recall. Mm -hmm. All right. Are you ready to vote? Yes. All, right. All of those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Item three, approval of a conceptual approval for the remodeling for the dental hygiene program at Rio Salado College. A motion to approve. So moved. Mr. Sarr moves. Second. Ms. Pearson seconds the motion to approve. Any discussion? Hearing none, um, uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Item four <clears throat> is the approval of a contract change order for building A, re-roofing at the Maricopa Skills Center Expansion Project uh, at, uh, by Gateway Community College. Motion to approve. Yes. Uh, Mr. Starr moves. Second. 
Uh, Mr. Lum seconds the motion. Ms. Thompson? Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, this is part of our bond program and it's a major maintenance project. Um, the building wasn't scheduled to be re-roofed uh, for a number of years, but the condition of the roof requires that it occur now, so we're recommending approval. Okay. Any questions? All right. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Item 5 is the approval of the contract award for Thomas Road parking lot reconstruction at Phoenix College. Ms. Thompson? Mr. President, members of the board, this also is part of our bond program and uh, the parking lot is in very um, bad condition, so it does need to be refurbished uh, and that's now more possible since some of the construction of the Hanover mm -hmm. Center is complete. The motion to approve. So moved. Second. Dr. Campbell moves. Uh, Mr. Lum seconds the motion for approval of the contract award for Thomas Road parking lot reconstruction at Phoenix College. Any discussion? Uh, all right, all those uh, in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, number six is the approval of a job order contract award for the remodeling of the Institute building. One, one CB1 at Glendale Community College. Ms. Thompson? Mr. President, members of the board, uh, this is to develop this um, site for uh, the ultimate location of the Chrysler Academy, which, has, which is a partnership that the college has had for some time, and uh, we do recommend its approval. Okay. Is there a motion to approve? No move. Dr. Second. Dr. Campbell moves. Uh, Ms. Pearson seconds the motion of the approval of a job order contract award for the remodeling of the Institute Classroom Building at Glendale Community College. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Um, item 7 is the approval of guaranteed maximum price amendment for expansion and remodeling of the Cranich Student Center at Paradise Valley Community College. Ms. Thompson. Mr. President, members of the board, this is also part of our bond program, and uh, we would propose with this project to expand the student center by about 12,000 square feet and then to renovate about 49,000 square feet. So it's a significant initiative at the college. Motion to approve. So moved. Dr. Campbell moves. Second. Uh, Ms. Pearson seconds the motion uh, to approve the guaranteed maximum price amendment for expansion and remodeling of the Cranich Student Center at Paradise Valley Community College. <coughs> Any discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, item 8 is the approval of conceptual approval for the Kirk Center student remodel of the Navajo and Zuni rooms at Mesa Community College. Ms. Thompson. Mr. President, members of the board, this is a project um, of approximately $1.8 million, and it's to renovate these two conference rooms at the college. Um, it's one of the older facilities, so it's about 4,600 square feet of renovation, and it will add to the flexibility of the college um, in holding events and meetings. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Dr. Campbell moves. Second. Uh, Mr. Sarr seconds the motion for approval of the conceptual approval for the Kirk Student Center remodel of the Navajo and Zuni rooms at Mesa Community College. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Number nine is the approval of conceptual approval for the T1 uh, building remodel at Glendale Community College. Ms. Thompson. Mr. President, members of the board, uh, this is about a $4 million project, part of our bond program, and it will remodel about 16,000 square feet and update classrooms, labs, and offices. Okay. I move to approve this item. Mr. Lum moves to approve. Say again. Nine. Number nine. IT. Mr. Lum moves to approve. Second. Second. Mr. Sarr seconds the approval of conceptual Second. approval for the T1 building remodel at Glendale Community College. Any questions? Would all those in favor please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion carries unanimously. Number 10, approval of conceptual approval for the remodel of the Performing Arts Center at Glendale Community College. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Um, 
President, members of the board, this is part of our program that's been going on for some years to develop performing arts centers at colleges that lack those facilities and then to remodel the older performing arts centers. So this is one of the colleges that was is scheduled for remodeling. Okay. Motion to approve. So uh, Mr. Sorry moves. Second. Mr. Lum seconds the motion for approval of the conceptual approval for the remodel of the Performing Arts Center at Glendale Community College. Yes. Yes, I um, Deborah, how many uh, additional seats are you going to add to this? Um, Mr. Saar, I don't know that there are any seats that will be added to the facility. It's just to remodel. Bummer. <laughs> yeah, the information is done, yeah. I guess you knew that. I did know. I'm just kind of making a point here. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other comments? All right. All those um, uh, in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion approved unanimously. Number 11, <clears throat> approval of uh, Phoenix College Preparatory Academy submission of preliminary revision to the Arizona Department of Education. Ms. Thompson. Mr. President, members of the board, this is a requirement that we have to revise the budget based on the 100th day average daily membership for the Charter High School. So we are proposing a budget revision that would bring uh, the budget up to $637,000 um, approximately. Okay. Motion to approve. Hello. Mr. Sarah moves. Second. Ms. Pearson seconds a motion for approval of Phoenix College Preparatory Academy submission of preliminary revision to the Arizona Department of Education. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Number 12, the approval of Gateway Early College High School submission of preliminary revision to the Arizona Department of Education. Ms. Thompson. Mr. President, members of the board, this item is similar to the Phoenix College Prep Academy, and it also is seeking to reduce the budget or to change the budget based on the recalculated 100th day ADM, and that is a slight reduction, but still about $1.7 million. Okay. Uh, motion to approve. Uh, Mr. Okay. Lum moves. Mr. Sarr seconds. A motion for approval of Gateway Early College High School submission of preliminary revision to the Arizona Department of Education. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Item 13, approval of a resolution authorizing issuance and sale of general obligation refunding bonds, series 2012. Ms. Thompson. Mr. President, members of the board, this is the second and last time we'll be bringing forward a resolution to the board for authorization to issue and sell our refunding bonds. We brought that forward last month and would expect to save about $3 million in um, interest on the life of the bonds that remain. I would like very briefly to ask Kurt Freund, who is our advisor from RBC Capital Markets, he's our financial advisor, just to talk a little bit about where we are in the process and um, share any information that else, other information he may wish to share. Great. Mr. President, members of the board, my name is Kurt Freund. Uh, nice to see you all tonight. I know it's been a long night so far. Um, you know, let me talk uh, first uh, about uh, bond ratings and acknowledge and congratulate the board uh, and the district on maintaining its AAA ratings with all three rating agencies. Um, this district has experienced this for quite some period of time, but you are in rarefied air uh, with a AAA rating from all three agencies. I was trying to think earlier today uh, whether there are any entities, uh, public entities left in the state of Arizona with a AAA rating from all three agencies maybe one or two cities at most, uh, and certainly around the country for community college districts. Uh, I can't think of many community college districts that maintain a AAA rating from all three, so congratulations. Um, certainly, uh, it would be a good thing to do, and I'm sure your staff will provide these to you, uh, but taking a look at the rating reports is a great way as a governing body, uh, and for the staff for that matter, uh, to get a good independent read as to how someone whose job it is to analyze the finances of the district takes a look at the district. Um, they look at things like your financial policies, they look at things like your finances, your levels of reserves, uh, in this case the property tax base. They look at the competency of your management, including the board and the policies that the board sets. And so, again, uh, hats off to all of you for uh, main maintaining those AAA uh, ratings. Um, turning to the bond market and interest rates, uh, I'm sure most of the board members, many of the staff, uh, know that interest rates have been low. 
Um, they've been low for all types of uh, bond markets out there. In the municipal bond market, they've been particularly low uh, for the last several months due to really a lack of supply of new bonds coming into that market. Um, traditionally, you'd find uh, six to seven billion dollars of new bonds being uh, issued into the market on a weekly basis. We've seen weeks this year that have been as low as two to three billion dollars. And so it's a supply demand equation to set interest rates. If the supply of bonds is low, demand remains the same interest rates go down, and we've certainly seen that. Um, in this particular case, uh, you have an opportunity to refund some of your general obligation bonds. Uh, it's the uh, Series 2005 bonds. The interest rate on those bonds, to give you a sense right now, is at about a 4.2 percent level. Uh, you can go out and refinance them by issuing new bonds that yield about 1.3 percent, um, saving uh, should be north of $4 million. Uh, on a present value basis, net of all costs. So uh, certainly a good thing to do. And then the last thing I'd mention is, uh, uh, you know this uh, because I've told you it before, we review all of the district's debt when there's an opportunity for refinancing it, we bring it to the staff. It eventually makes it way, its way to the board if it makes sense. And so these are the only bonds that make sense to refinance at this time. In the interest of time, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. This is a good time for reasons you just established. We still have an authorization amount outstanding. Does it make any sense to, to put those out for sale under these circumstances as well, knowing that down the road we'll still need that money to cover our cost of uh, right. capital? Uh, President Burke, Mr. Sharp, uh, a great question. I was. Uh, it's funny, I was sitting in the audience thinking, okay, what's the question that they're going to ask that I wasn't <laughs> thinking about? And that, that was the question. Um, you know, particularly with the presentation about your budget for next year. Uh, you know, the answer on it uh, from my perspective is a couple things. One, I don't promote borrowing money until you really need to borrow money. That's kind of A. Um, B, as you get close, and I don't define you as being close quite yet. Your staff said spring of 2013, a little bit far away from that. That's a year from now, so a little, little too eager, you know, to get there right now, in my opinion. Um, but as you get a little bit closer, I think you absolutely take a look at that. And I would expect your vice chancellor to be, you know, uh, calling me and saying, hey, remember that conversation at the board meeting? You should look at that um, and certainly evaluate it. The third thing I'd say is interest rates are forecast to remain low for a while. Um, you would certainly know this. Others on the board know this, that the uh, Fed chairman has said interest rates should stay low through the end of 2014. I say don't always believe the Fed chairman, but certainly rates will stay low, uh, in my opinion. So I think you have a nice window here. Thank you. Very good. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. For you. The uh, is there a motion to approve? I so move. Mr. Sarr moves. Thank Doc, you. Uh, uh, yes, I've heard several seconds. Uh, Ms. Pearson seconds a motion for approval of resolution authorizing issuance and sale of general obligation refunding bonds, series 2012. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Um, we are now to um, Section B, Item 1, Approval of Employee Group Salary Schedule Proposals for FY 2012-2013. Ms. Jackson. Mr. President, members of the board, we recommend the governing board consider compensation adjustments for fiscal year 12-13 and that it do so by considering four proposals separately. Uh, for action, motion, and vote. Um, Mr. President, I, I will read each of these motions individually for action. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. President, members of the board, we recommend the salary schedules for residential faculty, Matt Craft, Safety PSA, MNO, CEC, Athletic Specialists, and the Skill Centers receive a 1.5% salary adjustment to the current fiscal year salary schedules. Okay. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Dr. Campbell moves. Yes. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are we voting on these separately? Yes, yes. Okay, so which one are you moving? The first one. She just okay. read it. Uh, the, um, all right, Mr. Lum seconds the motion for uh, adding 1.5% salary adjustment to the current fiscal year salary schedules. Any discussions? Just the comment again that I think it's um, due to the fact that we were able to save money in our health insurance that is partially able to cover this. Mm -hmm. I think it's well deserved for the people that transfer money from our health insurance to their own pockets, and I think that's a good way to spend money. Okay. Any other comment? Well, I don't necessarily agree with all of those comments, 
but um, and wasn't going to make a comment until that one was made because I, I'm very frustrated with um, some comments and positions that I have about some of the costs that have been shifted to health care. So to me, this is a little bit, that comment is a little bit of an insult to injury because basically here's a raise to pay for your insurance. So that's my position. Any other comment? All right. Um, are all of those who are in favor of adding one and a half percent salary adjustment to the current fiscal year salary schedules, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. I'm abstaining from number one. Um, all right. Um, the motion carries uh, four to one abstention. Um, number two, Ms. Jackson. Mr. President, members of the board, we recommend the adjunct faculty rate and residential faculty overload rate be um, $833 per load hour, representing a two and one half percent increase over the current rate. Okay. Is there a motion to approve? So move. Dr. Campbell moves. Second. Mr. Starr seconds a motion to increase the adjunct faculty rate to $833 per load hour, representing a two and a half percent increase over the current rate. Any discussion? Just that this is going to make us much more competitive in the adjunct areas. And that can have had a salary increase in many years. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a recognition of their, uh, their uh, benefit and their commitment and loyalty to this district, so uh, I'm pleased to do this. Well, not only, not only that, if I, if I was in a, a job where I couldn't get a salary increase, for two, three years, going, I'd have to start looking around. I mean, you can't do that to your family with inflation and health care costs and gas costs going up. You, you can't sit there and, and not get some kind of increase in salary and, and not look around for, mm -hmm. for another position. Any? Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion. We call for the vote. Uh, uh, is there a second for a motion to? It's been moved and seconded. We're in discussion. Uh, there's no second, uh, Dr. Campbell. In, any other comment or discussion? Or that, it was moved and seconded. Oh, did, did you second? Dana seconded. Dr. Campbell's comment? He had another motion. Oh. I'm, I'm lost here. Well, the, the motion is moved and second. We're in discussion. Well, yes, we have a motion and second. There was a motion to end discussion, and I didn't hear a second to that motion. Correct. Right. Right. So we're back to the original motion, which is to approve the, the salary increase. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Item three. Mr. President, members of the board, we recommend that employees and residential faculty, MAT, craft, safety, PSA, MNOC, C, skill centers who are not at the top of the scale as of fiscal year 2011-12 will receive a step adjustment. Okay. A motion to approve. So moved. Uh, second. Uh, Dr. Campbell moves. Mr. Lum seconds a motion for a step adjustment for all employee groups. Any discussion? Yes, I would like to make a comment that I feel very strongly that we're missing a really awesome opportunity right now in using this money to change the structure and the approach and the, the way in which we go about uh, looking at uh, advancements. And I think that this is not the proper way to do it. I don't believe that this is the direction we should be going and encouraging. Uh, this type of a culture, I think we need to be studying and using this money and holding this money to prepare for looking at more efficient, effective, and innovative and disruptive innovation type uh, approaches in the way that we do this. All for the vote. Uh, <clears throat> there's a motion to cease discussion and vote. Is there a second to that motion? Did not hear a second. Did you have a comment? Just, uh, you know, I'm never. Uh, in, in 14 years I was in K-12, we switched from a step system uh, to a system of uh, ranges for each classification. I, I voted for that then and I would, I would vote for that today. But in lieu of those changes, and I hope we do talk about those in the future, um, this, is, um, you know, uh, this is worth doing. Any other discussion? All those in favor of a step adjustment for all employee groups, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Uh, motion passes four to one. Uh, item four, 
Ms. Jackson? Mr. President, members of the board, we recommend that we adjust the salaries of regular and full-time board approved employees earning less than $30,000 a year to the nearest step in their grade that is greater than or equal to $30,000. This would occur after any other fiscal year 12-13 salary adjustments are made. Okay. Is there a motion to approve? So move. Dr. Second. Campbell moves. Ms. Pearson seconds a motion to adjust uh, employees earning less than $30,000 to the nearest uh, step in their grade following uh, salary adjustments uh, in the uh, previously voted on uh, uh, increases. Any discussion? Just to clarify, we're making sure that no one makes less than $30,000. Mm -hmm. uh, they're a full-time employee, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Kind of sad that thirty thousand dollars is even talked about in today's world, but that's just what yeah. uh, Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, all right. I do have a question um, that has been asked, and um, that now this thirty thousand, Nikki. Is thirty thousand base, or is this thirty thousand take home? Base. Okay. That's what I. I just want to make sure I didn't yeah. miss big, because I didn't <laughs> did relook at it and read it, and it didn't say that. Big difference. Mm -hmm. Let me. Um, all right. Yeah. Item seven on the agenda uh, for information costs. items. Uh, Section A is Board Resource Workplace Violence Prevention. Ms. Jackson. Mr. President, members of the board, our um, District Enterprise Risk Management Department and Office of General Counsel have had an opportunity to review our workplace violence prevention programs and are recommending um, that we amend the existing program to assure greater consistency and that uh, we have um, defined breadth of our workplace violence prevention program commensurate with our, commensurate with our, our uh, <coughs> employer obligations and workplace violence obligations that we are um, looking to promulgate as a system. Um, it's submitted for informational purposes only yes, at this point. So. Yes, this is not a, we're not voting on this one. Nope. Uh, all right. Uh, any uh, questions about this item from the board? So this is first reading and we're going to? No. Not even a board. <coughs> not even a board. <coughs> um, all right. The item nine uh, before uh, item nine is uh, monitoring reports. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Thompson. Mr. President, members of the board, the first of the two monitoring reports is the budget analysis report through March 31st. That's nine months of the fiscal year. And uh, our spending pattern is similar to prior years. Same with revenue collections and nothing um, different to report than in prior months and nothing unusual compared to what we were projecting. Uh, and then the uh, 2004 general obligation bonds. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, we have issued about $800 million in general obligation bonds through four issuances over the last several years. We do have $151 million left in authorization, as discussed earlier. We've got about 82 percent of uh, all of our issuance to date that has been expended or encumbered, and the remainder we would expect to start to be encumbered and spent over the next year or so, hence our projection of a bond issuance next year, somewhere around this time. Mm -hmm. Um, the uh, I was flipping through my uh, agenda and I saw something about Phoenix College. Uh, uh, that was in the uh, okay. That that was not a presentation. That was just an approval. Okay. Um, all right. Our next regular board meeting is May 22 uh, at 6:30 p.m. We will not have a work session in early May because all of us will be going to graduations. Right. <laughs> Look forward to seeing you back here in May. This meeting is adjourned.